Well, thank you very much first to you, Philippe Walter, for inviting me for the Collège de France. Um, truly honored to be here. And I will go and take you on a trip, a trip through Europe, which will take us from, indeed, um, France, but we start, as we can see, actually, in Italy, Bienvenuto Cellini, 1500, 1571 is when he lived. But then we will also look at sculptors who went from the north, then actually to the south. And um, we will make a pass, actually, just like Bienvenuto Cellini did, where he not only worked in Italy, but he also worked here, of course, in, uh, in France, uh, around 1540. Uh, together with other Italian artists like Primaticcio, uh, Leonardo, or of course, everybody that you know. Um, I will talk with, um, with a little bit of, well, let's say, engagement, because I really, truly love this field of, of, of the bronzes. Now we're looking of, uh, at uh, large bronzes, but mostly I think my talk will be on the statuettes, the small bronzes, which are about this high. The study itself of these bronzes has been done, well, for a very long time. And what you can see here, and I will, oh, here it is. This, funny enough, is very important. Julius von Schlosser, uh, a German uh, connoisseur on these bronzes, he's holding the sculpture. And that, in many cases, is indeed taking place. But it's also very important, as we will see, going through this talk itself. The other thing... So we have the connoisseurship, the method of study, where we indeed have the connoisseurship, which is very important to understand, to see, looking at the stylistic views or the appearances of, of the objects, uh, that we nowadays also compare that with, in this case, X-ray fluorescence spectrometry, uh, uh, meaning the scientific parts of the study of these fields. And these fields then encompass, indeed, the objects, which are always in the central place, and then from, let's say, an art historian uh, point of view, but then also from a scientific point of view, which I will also correlate in the end. One of those magnificent small bronzes, the Hercules Pomarius, which is made by Willem van Tetrode. And Willem van Tetrode was a sculptor from Delft who indeed went to the south. He was uh, working in Germany, in Munich, for instance. He also worked uh, with Bienvenuto Cellini. And this is quite, quite interesting, as we will see later on as well. This small bronze, well, approximately 30 centimeters high, is something that I will explain to you how are these bronzes, and in this case, a hollow bronze, because everything that you see here is, of course, the surface, and you can see nothing from the inside. There are no holes or anything to put an endoscope in. Uh, you cannot see on the inside, so we have to study this in a different way. But first, let me explain to you how are these objects made. If this was the original, the production of a Holocaust bronze, if this sculpture that we are now looking at uh, from the Hercules Pomarius, then it would start with a frame or a skeleton, I would say, made of iron wire. On top of that, one would have the clay that is already almost finished in, let's say, 95% of the final sculpture itself. So this is, in French, le cire perdu, uh, in English, last wax casting, is exactly what you see here, a layer of wax, the yellow part is the layer of wax which is on top of that sculpture which was created in clay. After which, we put in various what we call core pins, which are at dedicated places in the sculpture, that protrude through the wax layer and go inside of the core material, the core clay material. And as you can see, we will, uh, there are some vents which are also made of wax connected to the wax surface. And actually the funny thing is, if you would look at this surface right now, it would look exactly the same in wax as it would in bronze. So covering everything up, with this, again, investment layer on the outside, I have some more pictures on that in a minute, then what happens is that with the heating, the burning actually, the, uh, the heating of 
that mold, we have the, the wax which is then retrieved, which goes out, the clay both inside core and the investment material which is baked, and then of course you have a very thin layer in between, just like that, that remains. And that stays in place because we have these core pins that make sure that which are in the investment material from the outside are also in the core material and as such because they are at certain places where the sculptor thinks beforehand where they have to be put that exactly two of them will stay and remain in the same place. So after which when the metal has been molten it will be poured in here, it will go through the various parts as what we see here and then it actually comes out. Apparently my presentation is a bit nervous, I'm not, but that is what we see here. Uh, then after which the investment material is removed and then also these vents which are there are also being removed and what remains is the surface, the crude surface of the bronze. And in many cases, and I, I, want to show you, I wanted to show you especially this sculpture, in many cases those bronzes are then chased. This is what we call the direct method. This means that the sculptor started from this, uh, this sculpture and he really invented this from the very beginning with the, uh, uh, the material, what we see here, the wire, the iron wire, still in. But there is also a method of making a copy of something with, which already exists. So what we are calling in that case an indirect method. So this, what you see here, and I will go through the whole process, indicates how can we actually show or how can we make a copy of an existing either bronze, terracotta, uh, a vase, doesn't matter what kind of object that one has, that if we have, for instance, the mold for what we see here, the piece molding, as long as those piece molds are done correctly and they are taken apart because they're made in plaster, then after which we can pour in the wax. So putting them back together, pour in the wax, slush it like that, pour it out again, and a very thin layer of wax remains on the inside. But this is different from the direct method, because in the direct method it really started from that wire, then on top of that the clay, and on top of that the wax. So what we do here is, after the model has been retrieved, there is, uh, in this case, plaster, which is put on the inside of that piece mold that we just had, on the inside of that wax recovered uh, piece that we have. So here you also clearly see those uh, protruding, and at various places, protruding iron pieces, corpins, which go through. And the first layer, I must say, the first layer that you see here, this is part of an experiment that I've done, and we will see the results at the very end as well. But it is quite important because what the Italians, and in this case Bienvenuto Cellini has been using, for material to put around here, they were using at the time in the 16th century much more organic materials such as horse dung, uh, the remnant, well, uh, horse dung and, and kine dung, that uh, organic materials that were used together with the clay. I'm not using clay in this case, I'm using uh, chamot, grog, and uh, uh, Paris um, and plaster. So putting those two layers on top of it in a very thin and very finely sieved material, combined of course with water, that will then adhere to the wax surface, and after which a coarser material, which is doing the same, so creating that investment material, but then actually in, from very detailed, very fine, to much coarser, to very coarse afterwards, is that this is where it is really very coarse indeed, so I've made big chunks of it, and then finally casting the metal, uh, the port, uh, to pour the molten metal inside of these cases. After which, here are the results. And perhaps for some of you who have already done this technique themselves, one would see that I'm not using any, let's say, 
uh, vents or anything like that. I'm just using here the vent from or the, the, the mold actually where the metal is being poured in. Then it is being slushed around and then coming out through this part. Quite important as well because all the assumptions that people have been taking on this part is always that one has to cast using a lot of vents at various parts to get the, the metal going round in the mold as it is being poured. And to my opinion, that is not the case and that is not necessary. Um, in this case, I've cast, for instance, several branches from uh, a thickness of eight millimeters up to a thickness of 1.6 millimeters, where they still come out as what we see here. The chasing, as I uh, said, so at the very end, normally the assumptions, again, what we have when these bronzes are being cast is that they come out of the mold and after that's when they've been cleaned, they have to be chased with a hammer, a chasing hammer, and then a chasing punches, what you see here. My question is, is that always really necessary? And then the question pops up as to, so what do we have now? What kind of techniques do we have and what should we be using in order to study these, uh, these branches? And then again, what are the possibilities with the advanced analytical uh, techniques that we nowadays have? Because traditionally, what we've been using is X-radiography. Everybody, of course, uh, is aware of that. X-ray fluorescence spectrometry, well, having listened uh, to Philippe's talk uh, before this as well, I know for certain that you are familiar with that technique as well. What we know, of course, that this is the XRF, is a surface analysis technique, which simply means that we will, with these branches, that we most likely um, will penetrate the, the, the surface of, let's say, a couple of microns, 10, perhaps 20 microns, perhaps 30 microns, uh, the, uh, but at the most. So this is really a surface analysis technique. And with these bronzes that have been treated in various ways, well, that is also important to understand what the drawbacks of those techniques can therefore be. In order to understand that, I have been using neutron radiography, which is also called neutron imaging. That's the same word that I might be using here as well. And then neutron diffraction. <coughs> The Hercules Pomarius, and with a traditional X-ray. And clearly you can see that based on the attenuation and then also the thickness of the metal itself, you do not get a really truly clear vision of what is everywhere. Here the head is blurry because, or actually not blurry, it is so thick. So therefore a lot of the X-rays are being attenuated. And here there is really much less metal. So there is limited vision that we can get from these sculptures like that. So with these analytical uh, techniques, you can, one can actually really start to understand how that these bronzes have been made and how could they have been made. So let me take you to a synchrotron. And this is indeed a synchrotron. This is not a neutron facility, but the image by itself is really nice. So I thought I'll put that in, especially uh, going to the Paul Scherer Institute in Villigen in Switzerland. Uh, in the morning when you wake up and you are recovering to the land of uh, physicists and uh, being there, well, for me, as uh, Philippe explained, a little bit of an outsider, uh, still one looks for the beautiful images, I guess. That I was not successful doing uh, the beautiful images, in this case with the beautiful objects. This is not a Rijksmuseum object, clearly, as you can see. Uh, this is where the neutrons come out within uh, uh, the neutra, uh, the neutrons which are being facilitated at uh, the base, then we have here a rotating table. And what is very important to understand is that we will take with the CCD camera behind there, each time for each degree, we will take an image. And doing that 180 degrees, and then with all the data that we have like that, we can start to extrapolate that. So how does that work? Well, we have the source, the neutrons, which are being there, a collimator, so think of them as lamellas, so as, as like a curtain view where they are equally being put through. And then the object for what we have here, and then you see those different cubes that we've uh, used there. These different cubes representing different elements and different elements representing different gray values. And with these different gray values, that is something that we are going to make use of. How? 
Well, first we have to understand the following. That if we look at x-rays which are being attenuated, this goes linear. And you, so therefore, the higher the atomic weight is, the more of the x-rays which are being attenuated held back so that you will not see them. They will not be retrieved because of the atomic weight of the material. They will be uh, attenuated indeed. So let's think, for instance, of, of, of lead, which is over here. So lead is a very good shielding for x-rays. But as you can see over here, neutrons simply pass through very easily, very rapidly. So leaded bronzes is something that we see a lot. So if we have just with the 280 or 320 kilo electron volts that we normally use, if you have a leaded bronze, in many cases, you don't even go through the bronze itself. With the neutrons, huh, no problem. Simply vroom, go through it like one meter thick even if you have to. 29, copper, also quite low, as you can see, for the attenuation if you compare that to the neutrons. So what kind of images do we get with that? This is an X, Y, Z detected neutron signal, which is then with the CCD camera being detected. And what do we see? Well, clearly different gray values from the X, for instance, uh, X axis. You really see that another material is in here, but you also see that there are some materials in there. Well, also showing something over here that at the very end, for the ones who do not wish to leave at uh, 12.30, I will have a movie for that as well, where you can actually really see what happened inside of that bronze, and then we can really start to understand how these bronzes have been made, and what went wrong, and what did not go wrong, and how did it actually end up in, well, in the sculpture that we have nowadays. So with the various, as you can see, if you take it from three directions and do that 180 degrees long and then extrapolate that with, in this case, we used VG Max from uh, Studio Max, uh, the software from them, and, and it's astounding. It's like, wow, it's beautiful for what is being produced. The difference is that we can now get with neutron radiography or imaging, you can also do the tomography. Tomography means that you can make the sculptures or actually uh, that you go inside and that you can really slice it up in any possible way that you, that you want to think of. That for instance, for this bass playing man, of which I will have a, a picture in a second, uh, that you can make cross sections and that you really see what is inside. And that is also important to understand for what is inside, because what is it that we are looking at? One of the things with this sculpture was something, well, that we always thought it was made by Hendrik de Keyser, and then later on we came to the conclusion it could never be. And that was based on the arms, as well you can clearly see that there another metal is there present, so that the arms are connected, or actually uh, put against it. But then you cannot see this from the outside, so this is really only visible from the inside, and in this case, with the neutron imaging that we have. There are some drawbacks. Okay, tomography is possible, better technological interpretation, and then indeed the question of the need for structural information, because I would now would like to know what is exactly that material that is there on the inside. Radioactive. So we have to do the X-ray, uh, the XRF analysis, because we know that the uh, half life of, of some elements, for instance, like cobalt, really takes a very long time. They become radioactive, so depending on the elements that you have inside of the bronze, one might not be able to put them in a showcase again unless it is a lead showcase. What does that mean? What do I actually mean with that? Well, if it's copper, uh, if it is lead, if it is tin, uh, arsenic, these metals, that is just fine. But like I said, if we have, for instance, cobalt uh, in it, but in that case, it would never be a Renaissance bronze because cobalt would never have been used during that time. The radioactivity uh, is, well, uh, a problem indeed because, of course, like I said, you will not be, it stays radioactive and, of course, in, in Switzerland, but anywhere. They will never leave, uh, these objects will never leave the premises unless it is really certain that there is no radioactivity anymore. So the half-life of the copper, etc., is about, when we do these analysis, three weeks, and after three weeks, there's no um, radioactivity measurable anymore. So after that we've done that, the neutron radiography, then there is the traditional effects versus 
radiography, neutron radiography and neutron diffraction. Because we now know that there is something inside. Now we want to know, okay, what is inside? So what we could use for that is indeed X-ray fluorescence. But there is a nasty aspect of that. I take this small ball, 18 centimeters high, as an example. We've measured it at various places as what you can see here where it is indicated. And look here as well, an old repair technique took place there as well. What you have to understand is what happens with these bronzes, especially when they have been heat treated after they have been manufactured. Well, there will be uh, diffusion of the metal inside, segregation of metals depending on what the alloy is. What does that mean? That actually, well, what it means very simply is that the surface will alter, will change. And if that is or is not being removed, that is essential. But in many cases, it is not necessary to really remove that completely to, let's say, that you have to grind it down and that you really have the rough surface again. So what are we looking at right here? Here, the proper right rear leg above the repair has you know, this measurement for what we see over here. And clearly, you can see that the copper content at these various places on the same bronze, which has been cast in the same way, but which has been treated in a different way, has different analysis showing up from surface analysis using the XRF. Many of my colleagues are uh, using XRF, I'm actually still uh, doing work together with them as well on, on the use of XRF, but really with the understanding that there are a lot of drawbacks of this technique as well and a lot of possibilities. So it's really making use of both things. So coming to that bass playing man, because that is what we nowadays think of, uh, of somebody who was indeed playing the bass and that he was actually part of an automat so that it was like a functioning more sculpture like that. Though, well, I, I still, that's together with my, my colleague Fritz Scholte, uh, that we are in a very nice and close debate about that. What could have been the true meaning of this object, but not to Hendrik de Keijzer anymore. Based on this ultimate um, ID, we actually came to the conclusion that, hey, science can be really useful in order to use that in art history to say that things can or cannot be for what we think it is. And also for Hendrik de Keijzer, we know, well, he was an, an architect and also a sculptor who made many uh, bronzes and also in the Netherlands, for instance, the mausoleum of William uh, of Orange in, the, in Delft. He was a very poor caster. And actually, <laughs> when we look at this bronze, this is extremely well made. So you clearly see the difference between the two. So what we have to do now is indeed use the neutron or what we're doing now with this part. We want to know what is inside. And then we are going again to, let's say, a better picture uh, to the neutron facility of ISIS, what we see here. And here the synchrotron, the diamond light source, which is at the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory near Oxford. And here it is standing in a machine which is called Engine X, which is a neutron diffractor. First of all, let's go back. So we see this, the traditional ways, X radiography of this sculpture. Then here we see the X radiography and here the results from the neutron radiography where we can also see with the uh, different colors that we've added to it that indeed different materials are in there. So we're making uh, use of, of Bragg's law uh, uh, on diffraction. And here what we can also see with the source and then with the neutrons coming out, time of flight mode, uh, what we're using for that. And then here where the sample and especially this specific point in the center where you see where you can actually align it and then say, I want to have information from that specific part. And that is when the signal is being detected. So what we're doing here is that we want to have the signal, not from the outside, we get a bulk analysis of that, two by two by two millimeters, and that is exactly what we want to have because with the X-ray fluorescence spectrum, with the XRF technique, one always takes like a spot measurement, just the surface, and in this case, I want to know what is the volume of it, the bulk message, because especially with metals, and especially if it contains, for instance, lead, then the lead, is not in the matrix of uh, the copper and tin, because copper and lead, they don't mix together, only to 0.4%. And 
And if you have, in this case, uh, the different peaks showing, and also the different peaks shown, then we can actually come to the conclusion that this is a ladder brass. A ladder brass. Well, how can we now say, or how can we actually retrieve the information from these branches, but then at various points of the sculpture? So how can we perform a focused diffraction analysis of internal features without having to make cross? So this is really completely non-invasive. So what we're doing, basically for what is written here, what we're doing is we use the information that we have from the neutron imaging, the XYZ analysis, where we made with the tomography, the analysis from, and then we know where to look for because we know that there is something different going on. So first we did a study with, uh, with complex uh, samples, actually the ones that I made myself. Then we did the diffraction analysis on internal features, and of course we used Rietveld, uh, Rietveld refinement for that as well. So really having a lot of samples which were being analyzed, and what kind of peaks do we have, what is the height of the peak, what is the width of the peak, the exact place of the peak, and then based on that, you can calculate from the lattice parameter what uh, the exact composition of the sculpture is. This is an example of how the diffractor beam uh, actually works. And here you see the very, uh, various axes, the various places where we then took the bulk analysis of the material, and which you can then see in the lattice parameter, which we accordingly calculated to the various uh, uh, compositions. What do we see then? Well, you see that indeed uh, there are variations which are taking place. So for me, it was also the point, if we are using X-ray fluorescence as an analysis technique, and you're taking one point to make your analysis, how do you know that it's, let's say, oh, this is 70.6.5 uh, 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 amount of copper. Well, yeah, but if you take it on another position, it's going to have another composition. So if we are going to say, oh, these bronze, they are made of that composition, typically, and that's where the difficulty actually is, typically of that period, hmm, 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 hmm. First of all, as we see also with bulk analysis at various points, that composition differs. And secondly, well, also with the XRF analysis, when we take that, it's just a surface analysis technique. So like this, because based on the X, Y, Z, Factors. So when we align that, so the data from the Paul Scherer Institute, when we align that at the rutherford Epperton Laboratory and set this exactly here to pinpoint it and to bring it back with uh, three different points, you could really say, I want to analyze this specific bar or this specific part which is over there. And then clearly you can also see the differences which then occur, uh, that this indeed is, is simply a truly, well, let's say almost pure copper uh, rod which is inside. Of course, then the real thinking starts. So what does that mean? And that is, in this case, uh, that it meant that, of course, they could never be within the casting process and that it is from a different point of view when, when we came to the ultimate thinking. The possibility of researching finishing techniques, neutron diffraction. So we have been now using XRF, neutron radiography and diffraction. And now there's another aspect that we can use, and that is stress and strain analysis. That is also what these neutron diffractors are very capable of, of doing. But first, I will bring you back to Bienvenuto Cellini. You don't have to read the whole text. Just this case. Well, it is rather important at the same time. And so the first cast I took in my furnace succeeded in superlative degree, was so clean that people, had, so it came out of the mold very beautifully. And then it is true that certain Germans and Frenchmen who found the possession of marvelous secrets pretend that they can cast bronzes without retouching them. This is written in his La Vita. As you probably all know, 1629 actually, 1729 when it was uh, published, might be an error there in my mind. Uh, because he wrote it, or was written uh, on him, let's say from the mid of the 16th century, around 1550, he lived till 1571, and in 1568 he also produced, next to La Vita, so his own life works, he also produced a treatise on sculpture making and goldsmithing, and, and all of a sudden this takes place at this certain era 
or, or this certain moment in, in his life. So what is he talking about? These are these punches again, these hammers. And then it is also, we have to understand when we talk about Bienvenuto Cellini in Florence at the time, where he made the Perseus like we showed at the very, like I showed in the very beginning, um, which was then erected also around the mid of the uh, 16th century. That Giorgio Vasari, who was of course very known as an uh, art historian, let's say one of the first art historians who wrote about sculptors, painters, and architects, that he also, in his preface, before he starts to write about the, well, these, these artists themselves, that he also talks about chasing tools, punches, chisels, and files to remove the material. So when it comes out of the cast to remove the material, what is necessary? Here we see them, various punches for various techniques. And this is also, as an example, what that material looks like and why it has to be chased after it has been retrieved from the mold. And if we use that, let's say, Italian technique, so where Bienvenuto Cellini is using a preparation layer of, so when the wax is finished and when he uses organic material combined with, let's say, clay or any other material that he might have been using, then this organic mater material, when the wax is being heated, uh, so when the whole investment is being heated, the wax comes out, but these organic materials, which are also on the surface, they get burned. And as they get burned, they also come out, uh, simply nothing stays in there. So when the metal is being poured in, they go into these crevices, and these crevices is what you see here, all these crudeness, of all that crudeness, is of course from the wax layer and then the investment material which was put against it, where inside of that investment material, uh, the organic material then has carbonized and taken away. So if there is nothing left there, simply air, when the melt, uh, metal is poured in, it will fill up those little gaps and that is what we see here. And that is why these bronzes have to be chased. So Fazari says also, with other tools that scrape, eh, use pumice. And if one uses pumice, you will not get, well, this result immediately because you would first have to really chase the whole surface down and then use pumice at the very end and then, indeed, you can get surfaces like these. But there is an interesting thing because in 1551, when Vasari first wrote about how to create these bronzes in his preface, in 1568, in the same time, actually, when the Hercules Pomarius was made by Willem van Tetterode, this is something that Giorgio Fazari now says. At, and so in 1568, he writes a second edition from his treatise, well, is of the architects and the sculptors and the painters. And then in chapter 11, he said that modern tours, the force of small castings, but that is a truly marvelous thi a thing which has come to pass in our times. This mode of casting figures, large as well as small, so excellently that many masters make them come out and the cast quite clear, so they have not to be chased with tools. And this, of course, was against, let's say, the lag of Bienvenuto Cellini. He was like, no, 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 no. It's exactly like I showed you earlier. It's impossible. There are people who vowed to have these secret methods of having been able to do that, but that is not the case. And now we come back to this Willem van Tetrode. And why do we come back to him? Well, he worked at Bienvenuto Cellini, actually on the Perseus, at the pedestal itself, in the creating of the pedestal. So we know that actually this guy was, he worked, uh, lived from 1525 to 1580, um, one generation older, and that he had new ideas of how to do these things. What are we looking at? The detail of the shoulder, this is what we're looking at. And this is in detail. There's two things that we see here on the surface of this bronze. First of all, the organic material that you see here, clearly, and everywhere around it. But more importantly, this fin of metal that we see here, and here it is a little bit enlarged. This fin of metal can only be there if the molding material, the investment material, which is put on top of the wax at the very beginning, has a very little crack in it, where when the wax is being uh, melted out, the metal will pour in. So this, is what, this metal here, this fin, is really connected to the bronze itself. 
So if it was chased, if it was after the, uh, uh, the process of, of casting, if it was chased then, it could never have been here because it would have been removed. Because as soon as one starts to chase a surface, immediately one sees that surface as well. One notices that on the surface. This is a reconstruction that I made. And now I'm going to show you several of these, let's say, old and new. Old on how do we look at, at chasing and how can we see now that it was chased and, and what are the new aspects of it. So for instance, here at the Kunstdeutsch Museum, a very old inventory number, meaning that it was already uh, in the Ferdinand the second collection when they uh, collected this piece, so a 16th century piece, and where you can also clearly see the hammering marks of these bronzes, hammering marks such as, uh, punching marks such as these. Well, then we go, then I wanted to put in the equation, what I wanted to look at with this neutron diffraction, I wanted to see that if we have this bronze of which I think that it was cast and actually not chased afterwards, but that it came out of the mold so pristinely, so beautifully, that no chasing had to take place. Did that exist? Yeah, yes or no? And then to the level as for what we've seen here. I remember in 2003 that I was giving a, a presentation at uh, the Frick collection at the, in, in New York, and I said, I think that this is taking place, that one could cast bronzes and that you did not have to chase them. All of my colleagues, they were saying like, nah, 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 nonsense, that is impossible. Well, with Newton diffraction, this is something that we actually now analyze. With this bronze, you also see here this crack of the molding material, which was then in the back. And then there in the back, so meaning a crack in the molding material where the molten metal also floated in. And this is a bronze where you again see the punching marks. And this is what we've done with the stress and strain. So we've taken also samples, I've made samples myself, where they were just cast and then cast and then chased. And you can really see the differences, uh, the different uh, in the graphic, you really see the difference that there is no elastic strain or strain actually here in the only cast sculptures. And here you, especially uh, on this part, you can see that this corresponds to what we see here for the cast figure and then chased. And then also with this one at the various points, you did not get, we did not get any signal showing that this was indeed cast and then chased, exactly like we expected, of course. Brings us to Wenzel Jamnitzer. Wenzel Jamnitzer, one of the most famous goldsmiths, who has worked for many courts around Europe at the time. And what is very important is that he depicts himself here with these flowers made, uh, made of silver, in this case. And this is also for sculpture, and you can see here a wax model that he made, and this is the sculpture that he made. And this is actually a tool to uh, calculate how much, if you have wax, how much that weighs, how much do you need in another material, such as silver or in bronze, and that you know the exact uh, measurements, because the, uh, the weight, of course, the density is different. What do we see now? So thinking of Vasari, 1551, modern tours de force of casting bronzes, uh, with, uh, but also other metals in order to do that. And what do we see here? This is about one meter high, uh, the table piece of Vincent Jamnitz. And what do you see here? Well, little lizards, little flowers, everything like that, which is very small, very detailed, extremely detailed as we can see here. This is a lizard about you know, three centimeters wide. And still look at the detail that you can, so casting after life, this is called, uh, what is done by Wenzel Jamnitzer in 1549. So not <laughs> later as to what Bienvenuto Cellini says, well, there are Germans and Frenchmen who found to have the possibilities. No, 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 it really existed. So for me, at the very beginning when I showed you those indirect casts, this is the result, the surface, what you get. And so here was a little air bulb, for instance, where a little piece of metal uh, went in, but you can really create these surfaces using the very same materials uh, with, as what they have used, could have used at the time. So according to the treatises, oxhorn, cloth, frayings, just a little triply, horse kind or dung, and iron fillings. That is what they have been using in the material on top of the wax to create their investment material. What I've been using is ox gal. Of course, the oxes were there and the gal was also there and they, well, made soap of it in the 17th century and also before uh, we know that that existed. 
Plaster of Paris, which was there, and Grog, which is uh, Grog Chamot, uh, of course, as you would say it in French. So if we now uh, start to finalize and, and then looking at uh, what Prima Ticcio did at Fontainebleau, making use of uh, the castles here in France for uh, François Le Premier, uh, the king of France at the time where he said to Prima Ticcio, I want you uh, to go to Rome and uh, in accordance with the Pope at the time that he indeed made copies of various large bronzes which were then uh, recreated here, or a very, uh, large uh, marbles, I should say, which were then recreated here in, uh, in Fontainebleau, uh, where also Bienvenuto Cellini worked and where, of course, he made his beautiful salt cellar. But what do we see now? And really, I, I really want to ask you, please go to Fontainebleau. It's, it's besides the fact that it's, it's beautiful, if one now looks at these bronzes and, and if, if you go around these bronzes, then you always see these, these very crude aspects, as you can, uh, even, uh, very crude castings, the method as, like the French, and at that time also, the, the Italians were using. Taking you to that trip, because you also might have to go to Innsbruck, uh, to the cenotaph of Maximilian I. And it was started again in the 16th century, and what you see here is, is quite amazing. Uh, I would say, very complicated castings of very large, life-size bronzes, very complicated bronzes, because they have a lot of uh, material on it. And remember when I said, if it is chased, you will immediately see that on the surface. So there is no possibility, there, it's impossible, completely impossible, that if a bronze is cast and one starts to chase, and that one says, only, uh, they only chased a little bit, you cannot see that. Uh, 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 uh. Impossible. This is when the surface is being chased, you immediately see that. So here it is not chased. Here something happened. I don't know what. That is not visible anymore. But clearly something did happen. And also see the figures which are on there. But the other thing is, on these bronzes, what you also find, look, these little fins. What does that tell us? This was cast and not chased afterwards, only at this part where you can clearly see the chasing. But on this life-size sculpture, ha, huh, King Arthur, 1513, Stefan Godel, who made it, Albrecht Dürer, who, who actually made uh, the, the drawings for it. That's at the beginning of the 16th century, where they actually specifically say, ah, we've tried the Italian method, that's not really working. We want to think of our own method. So what they did is, indeed, they piece molded their direct castings, so meaning that they started with that iron wire and then with the clay inside and then the wax on top of it and then uh, on that wax, they've put, of course, these uh, various parts, uh, the, the various clay investment molds. But what they did is they made sure that they could take them apart again. And after taking them apart, they finished the inside of those investment molds again and then put them back to, uh, together and then cast the sculptures. But with such high complexity, it's, 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 it's flabbergasting. It's wow. It's wow that they could do that. Even still, today, I've, I've written to to 40 uh, bronze casters in Europe. Can you do uh, these kind of things like I've been doing now with the reconstruction? Everybody says, uh, yes. And then when you ask for an example, then I will say, no. You know, the result is never the same. So what they were able to do that, to really comprehend for what has been done in the past is, is enormous and, and to also to give the admiration for it. Neutron imaging prov uh, provides better results than the traditional X radiography to start a production techniques of hollow bronzes. But well, like I said, the film is at the very end. If XRF is used, the drawbacks of the technique should be taken into account clearly. Combined imaging and diffraction provide new insights in historic copper alloys. You know what the funny thing is? At the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory, together with Winfried Kockelmann, when I did the analysis, we uh, uh, produced an article on it in the Journal for Analytic Atomic Spectrometry. And one of the things, based on one, that was one of the two articles where we then actually decided, or where they decided, uh, this technique should be further developed. So now, at the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory, they are creating an imaging and diffraction station within the neutrons, neutron beams that they have. Thinking just that, you know, one always thinks of, of, of science and then, uh, let's say, conservation science or art historical science, if you want to call that, uh, as, ah, it's not so important. 
But still, with the ideas with, from our community, what we come up with uh, is, is really where other people say, hey, let's start to use that. So let's say 2015 is operational. Um, uh, and I'm thinking, hey, NASA is going to make use of it then as well. So you can get analysis, compositional analysis, inside of a material without having to, you know, saw through it or anything like that. Quite important, I would say. And not my work, this is really Pokemon's work. This is not my work. I think this is really Winfried's work. The fraction can be used to study certain strain effects, like we've uh, done that, and then new hypothesis, as I just explained. It brings me indeed to, well, let's say back home, even though not at home, feeling at home, the Rijks Museum, connoisseurship and science. The building that you see here is 9,000 square meters. It's just it's in the center of Amsterdam. Uh, it is where the University of Amsterdam, with the formation for people who want to become, become a conservator, a restaurateur, uh, is there together with the Rijks Museum conservation studios, uh, the restoration studios, and then also with the Cultural Heritage Agency, which has their uh, scientific department. So put that all together, and over here you can still see it, is what we call the, uh, no, over here actually, this, <laughs> sorry, my own building, uh, the villa where all our curators are, 60 in total. What is so important, and I'm so very happy that actually Philippe has, uh, has stressed that in, in the past as well, is the collaboration between the different fields. Because only if we do that, only if we really realize what could come out of that, again, wow. Again, that is something where we can say, where we can start to predict, hey, it's beautiful what we're looking at here, and whether it is a painting, a sculpture, or something else, but what is it going to look like in 100 years from now? Especially when you look at paintings, of course. Eh? We see the craquelé in, in, in the painting. Well, it wasn't there 100 years ago, or we take Rembrandt or anything like that, eh, longer ago. So we know that these objects change. What we have to know is what they change into. And this is where true collaboration between connoisseurship or curatorship or whatever name that you add, the art history field and the science field really have to come together. And they are doing that. We are doing that as an example as well for what Philippe has been doing here for years as well. To finalize, Continued and, and further research. What are we doing nowadays? Well, in the meantime, we've also uh, done some work on uh, that we, with neutron imaging, that we start to quantify what the metal composition is. We've written one uh, publication on that together with uh, Stefan uh, Petermans, Stefan Petermans from the Paul Scherrer Institute. Um, and what we've done is, is actually correlating, well, if you see the image, and then the gray values that you get from that. And if you know what the alloy is, a binary alloy, you can actually, based on the gray value, see what the composition of that metal is. And that is something that we have been doing uh, now with neutron transmission uh, measurements. The use of cold neutrons, what we also want to know in the future is, well, I talked about those vents and I showed you how little that I've been using. And what we want to do is also uh, show that no, or less vents have been used. Meaning we can also use cold neutrons, I've been talking about thermal neutrons earlier, and then cold neutrons and different technique, um, where with the cold neutrons, you can actually say uh, what the crystal structure of that material is. So, so uh, the uh, dendrites, etc. how large, was it cast, was it not cast, was it cast and chased? We think that we can also do that, use a cold uh, neutrons and then based on imaging. The historic and scientific meaning of alloys. That is something I have one more slide afterwards. And then dating of organic patina. Everybody must think that I'm a fool. And um, sometimes I think myself as well. But we, uh, there's, uh, based on that Hercules Pomarius, we took a cross section in, in his hair. So this is when the organic material uh, has, and so, so when this bronze was, was finished, there was an organic patina could be anything, like, like uh, a varnish, uh, a resin that was on top of it. We don't know exactly. Why don't we know exactly? Julius von Schlosser, the very one at the beginning, they were always holding these uh, objects. So the, the, the patina that could be on it usually wears off. This is why you always, at these Renaissance bronze sculptures, you see these black surfaces at some parts, and some parts they are not. Why not? Because they've been fondled. They've been held in their hands. But these black patinas that you still see on 
these, let's say, 16th or 17th century bronzes, they have decayed. This material, this organic material that has decayed over time, if you make a cross-section of that, which we've done as well, um, then you can see, actually see a stratigraphy of uh, the buildup of that organic material interacting with the bronzes underneath. So if there is an interaction between the two, between the organic material and the bronze underneath, can we also then start to correlate that on the age of these uh, surfaces? So we've looked, for instance, at uh, uh, 19th century surfaces which look the same from the outside. We even thought with an Adrian de Vries sculpture that we had an Adrian de Vries sculpture, only it was much later um, that it was made here in Paris in, in 1867. And the fact is, if it looks the same, and you think that there is no difference, but when you take a cross-section and you really see a distinct difference, this is where, well, dating of organic patinas is something that we should get into. How wonderful would it be? Because especially with the connoisseurship that we have, that people say, this is a 16th century bronze, where somebody, another connoisseur says, no, 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 it's not, this is a 19th century copy. Like we've had it in the Rijks Museum as well. Scholars who are saying two completely different things about the same object. This is where the science then comes in and should be able to say, ha, this can never be 19th century, this must be 16th century, or vice versa. That's where the dating is related to. Analyzing objects from the time period, alloys, minor and trace elements, isotope ratios, bronze cannon from 1615, Swedish copper, we don't know. We are looking now in the Netherlands in the 17th century as to what amount of copper was brought in through Japan and what amount was brought in from Sweden. And can you then do analysis based on the isotopes and then saying, ha, huh, this is typically from Japan, this is typically from Sweden. Well, this is Ari Papot's work, a PhD student uh, with us. Uh, so looking at the sculptures, in this case, 1657, uh, as we can see, by Artus Kalinus. And we are looking at the global trade and raw materials is reflected in all historic objects because these are the questions that we should ask ourselves. Not so much as to what are the analysis of, of, of the objects. No, we should look at, at what, what, could, what could it mean when we analyze these objects? What, what is the effect of that? I hope you've all visited us. And if not, I really do hope that you will come and visit soon because there are many beautiful things. Not realizing that you're very close by to many beautiful museums here, um, clearly the Rijksmuseum is worth a visit as well. And to finalize, this is the acknowledgement that I would like to give to many of my colleagues that I've worked with. Thank you very much. <laughs>